All right. So it looks like so far we've just got um, beginners, which you are in the absolute right place. Composting 101 could be for everybody, but definitely um, if you're just getting started, it'll be really helpful for you. We'll just give it another minute here. It's not quite noon. All right, so it is noon and we'll get started. Um, you know, a few people usually trickle in after the beginning. Um, if I wasn't presenting, usually that's me trickling in a few minutes late. Um, so my name is Cedar Walters and I work for the Ottertail County Solid Waste Department. Um, I maybe have met some of you or if you just got a compost bin in our compost bin and rain barrel sale, you may have received an email from me at some point. Um, so I do all kinds of education and outreach for the solid waste department about proper waste disposal, waste reduction, food waste, um, reusing, recycling. Um, and so I'm a passionate advocate for making less garbage because really I feel like what goes into our trash can um, is related to a, most environmental issues that we're experiencing, whether that's um, you know water pollution, air pollution, climate change, deforestation, we extract resources, we make them into stuff, we use them and we discard them. So what we're throwing away and how much of stuff we're throwing away has a direct impact on pretty much every other environmental issue. So um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting job. So feel free to pop questions into the chat as we go. Um, and I'll kind of revisit that probably towards the end a little bit, but feel free to pop in there with anything. Also feel free to share tips if you have gotten started and you find out something's working for you. Um, you can definitely pop in there. So <clears throat> let's see, composting 101. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yep, there we go. Enter your questions into the chat. And the, the fun thing about that compost sale, if you just got a compost bin, we this is the first formal year we participated in that and it's coordinated by the Recycling Association of Minnesota. And what was really exciting this year is we sold out of our allotment of 54 bins in three days. So I think that's really exciting because it shows that people are interested in composting and they really wanna know how to get started. And um, so next year we'll be expanding that sale actually. I know a lot of people were bummed that they didn't get one this year. There's lots of other options out there. So if you know people that didn't get a bin, that doesn't mean you need to wait a whole year. You can get them other places. You can make them out of free stuff. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. And so why compost, part of the reason why composting is so important is because in our country, we waste a lot of food. So I can't talk about composting without mentioning food waste. This is one of the best quotes I've come across that describes this issue. Imagine walking out of a grocery store with four bags of groceries, dropping one in the parking lot and not bothering to pick it up. That's essentially what we're doing in our homes today. So we're wasting so much food that we're feeding landfills almost as much as we're feeding people. So reducing food waste is really going to help mitigate climate change. We're not going to throw those resources in a landfill, but what we can't eat, we can at least compost. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a visual of how much we're throwing out. That orange slice is about 40% of the food we produce in this country. And uh, we did a waste audit here a couple of years, well, about a year and a half ago, and so we sorted through an entire neighborhood's worth of garbage and uh, whole meals, really, I mean, unopened packages of meat, unopened packages of celery, whole bags of grapes, um, burgers not bitten into apples that you could probably wash and it looks like you could almost eat them. So we're really just not paying attention in our homes. Um, food waste happens other places too, but the biggest um, kind of chunk of food waste, 43% is happening in our homes. Um, it's happening other places too, but that's like the biggest 
um, kind of area. All the other places like production or, or in retail settings are smaller slices out of that total. Um, and so there's just some costs associated with this, some of it's economic. So we waste um, enough food that it accounts for about 1.3% of our gross domestic product. Um, and each year that amounts to a loss of about $1,800 for a family of four. Um, so really this is, this is costing us money in addition to environmental harm. Um, that's enough energy to power the country for a week. And it creates more greenhouse gas emissions than most countries besides China and the US, which have more emissions. So food waste is, it's a really serious issue. And we can, if we can tackle that, it's gonna help a lot of other environmental problems at the same time. And we also lose all that human labor. Think of the hands that pick that food, um, you know, the people who have jobs driving it around, all that human effort is also wasted when we waste food. And then we're losing all the resources. So we, the food loss accounts for enough land that if we actually use that for food that people ate, we could feed the world's hungry. So um, hunger really is a problem of distribution rather than um, scarcity. There, there's plenty of food. It's just, we're not getting it to where it needs to be. We waste about 25% of our world's scarce freshwater resources. Freshwater is like 2% of all the water on the planet. And 25% of that is lost because we're irrigating and using it to grow food that nobody eats. And then we're losing soil fertility, and then we're not replacing it when that food waste goes to a landfill. So that's why compost is so essential. That's what's after dinner. I've been wanting forever to say that, so that's exciting for me. Um, and it's just nature recycling. This is going to happen all the time. And so in nature, if some, something is dead or decaying, it's breaking down, and we're just going to assist with that process when we're composting. So if you're feeling a little intimidated by composting, or you feel like you've read stuff, about how scientific it needs to be. I am kind of a lazy composter, I will admit it. If you throw stuff in a pile and you walk away and never touch it again, it's gonna break down, it's gonna compost. It's just not gonna maybe be as fast. You might have a little more issue with smell. Um, so you can do it imperfectly and you're still composting. So don't feel like if you're not an expert, you can't do it. This happens in nature all the time. We're just gonna facilitate it a little bit. So it's really just microorganisms um, and other decomposers that are digesting that dead and decaying organic matter and turning it into, um, it's not soil itself. It's not really even a fertilizer. We'll talk a little bit about that too, but it's a, a rich soil amendment that's gonna have a lot of benefits, more so even than a commercial fertilizer. Well, some benefits of composting, it can shrink your waste. So we did that waste audit I mentioned um, when, with the plate of, plate of wasted food there. So in residential garbage of Fergus Falls, um, we found that this green slice here was all of the organic matter that was in the garbage. So more than a quarter, close to a third. And so if you're a family of four, you might make about 600 pounds of compostable material each year, but most people are just putting that in their garbage can. That's going to feed a landfill instead of um, life in the soil. So oh, that adds up to about 60 billion pounds of food waste going into landfills each year. It's just the volume is really astounding. Um, and so just a little more on that data there. 26% so was food waste. A lot of it could have been eaten if it had been handled a little better, maybe paying closer attention to what's in the fridge, storing things properly, eating things up. Um, really, the most astounding part was just packages of things that had never even been, been used at all. Not just it not it wasn't just bad leftovers. It was whole packages of food that had never been used. Um, about ten percent was recyclable material that just didn't get recycled. Um, a lot of it was the real garbage, I guess, that doesn't have a home any other place. Um, some of that probably could have been prevented through reusable options and things like that. But this food waste part was really stunning, um, especially because that actually grew. Uh, the waste audit that was two years prior, that section of the waste was smaller. Um, and this is consistent with trends across Minnesota that the amount of organic waste in the garbage has gone up, unfortunately. Um, and so you can actually really have positive impacts on climate change or reduce climate impacts when you compost. Um, and that's partially because you're not moving waste around as much. Um, that's going to be kind of small because, you know, you're still going to have garbage that needs to be picked up, but organic matter and food waste is really heavy. It contains a lot of water, but it's still going to have somewhat of an impact. 
when food waste goes to a landfill, it's in an oxygen poor environment. And that actually, that very, very slow decomposition that happens in a landfill creates methane. Anaerobic bacteria create methane as a byproduct or as a waste product um, as their, uh, throughout their life cycle. That's their waste. And so when all that food waste is in a landfill, methane is produced. And that is a greenhouse gas about, I don't know, it's like maybe 25 to 50 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So um, when we feed landfills, we're also feeding climate change. Um, composting is going to help you build soil. The more carbon goes into soil, um, the better because it's it's capturing that carbon from the atmosphere. It's it's holding it as a reservoir. And then you don't have to use as much synthetic synthetic fertilizer. And synthetic fertilizers, commercial fertilizers, are often made from fossil fuels or fossil fuel byproducts. Um, so that's going to have an impact as well. And then you're going to improve the water holding capacity of your soil. So this connection is a little more indirect, but when you're having to water more frequently, um, that actually takes energy because to treat water or pump water requires energy, which, which is usually generated, well, at least these days, um, hopefully less and less by fossil fuels, natural gas, maybe coal, things like that. Um, and so there's this thing called the water energy nexus, and it just, it, it's kind of a complicated concept, but basically, Using more water requires more energy and creating energy uses more water. So these two things together um, kind of feed off each other and have a bigger negative environmental impact because each requires the other. You need energy to get fresh water or to filter water or you know, run water through a treatment plant. And then you need um, water for cooling and things like that in, in energy facilities. So they kind of are really, really closely connected. And I'm just gonna throw, before I forget, in the chat, um, a link to the compost story by Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground was a documentary narrated by um, Woody Harrelson. And it's all about regenerative agriculture and how that can really um, solve a lot of our environmental problems. The compost story is a six minute video that would be really easy for you to share with people you know, because um, we can all kind of spread the word about composting. And, um, that's just a fun one. You could share it on Facebook or whatever, or watch it yourself as a refresher. Um, it's just, it, it's accessible. It has a lot of fun celebrities in it talking about composting and really the power of composting. Um, and then you're going to return nutrients to the soil. So right now we're kind of breaking that nutrient cycle that has exist that exists in nature. Um, and we turned it into a linear cycle where we extract nutrients from the soil as we grow our food. And then those nutrients that, that we don't put into our bodies then are, are on a one-way trip to the landfill. Whereas in nature, um, you have this cycle where right, things that are dead and decaying and waste become food for new organisms. And so we've kind of broken that and we can fix that with composting. Compost is a soil conditioner. It's not a fertilizer. Um, it's better than a fertilizer because it's gonna uh, release nutrients slowly and it has lots of other benefits. So in a commercial fertilizer, you have um, potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen. So you have these kind of main nutrients, but you're missing out on a lot of other nutrients that are necessary for plant growth and nutrition. Um, so you're not getting all of that when you use a commercial fertilizer. Compost contains all kinds of other stuff that is not found in those commercial fertilizers. So it's gonna help retain water, Going to help retain nutrients in a sandy soil. If you have a really heavy clay soil, it's going to help loosen up that soil structure um, and actually help it drain better. So no matter the kind of soil you have, it's going to be a benefit. It also contains pumice, which is basically organic matter that is not easily broken down by decomposers, and it's going to help soil have better structure. And then it's like a probiotic too. It's going to feed the life in the soil and help all those beneficial microbes that are gonna to continue to make nutrients available to your plants. So compost really is a regenerative probiotic for, um, for the soil. And so when you're getting started with composting, um, not everyone's situation is gonna be the same. So you're gonna to need to think about uh, what is your setting? Um, how much food waste or how much organic waste are you gonna have available? So if you are maybe um, living by yourself, uh, maybe you don't have a big backyard, you just have a little bit, 
you might not need a whole huge system. You might want some composting worms in a small bin that you can keep in your heated garage or entryway. Um, we have composting worms here. They're pretty easy. They don't smell and they could take care of kind of a smaller volume of food scraps. Um, if you just, you know, don't want the, the larger um, kind of effort that goes into backyard composting and they're fun for kids. If you want a lot of usable compost, say you do a lot of gardening or, or landscaping, you might want a multi-bin system. You might want to stockpile leaves in an extra uh, bin off to the side um, because you'll find out leaves are going to be really valuable. If you're somewhere in the middle, maybe you want one of the comp uh, composter like we were selling in our compost sale. I'll have pictures of some, some of those in a minute. Um, and then maybe they'll fill it a couple times a year. You might still need some leaves or something on the side, but you know, it really is flexible and you just need to think about what your situation is and, and choose accordingly. It's not one size fits all. Um, and so the basic steps are pretty simple. You're gonna get a bin, you're gonna figure out where to put it. You're gonna layer in your food waste with some dry, woody or leafy waste. You're gonna layer it like lasagna. I have a great diagram for that. Then you're gonna turn it or mix it once in a while and then you're gonna use it. So the basic steps, are, are pretty basic. Um, so if you're kind of following this and you're putting the right stuff in there, you're gonna be totally fine. Lots of different bin options here. You know, uh, feel free to throw in the chat what you're thinking of doing or what you've gotten, or if you're already composting what you're using and if you like it. Um, so I'll kind of go backwards here. The one on the right is very similar. Um, that black plastic bin is very similar to the ones we were just selling. This was a model um, that was sold a couple of years ago, but it's simple. It has a lid that locks on. Um, so that's kind of a nice starting point for a lot of people. You, there's a lot of DIY options like this one with the foot on it. They've created their own tumbler out of just a, a waste container and you can drill some holes in it for airflow and uh, call it good. A tumbler is more expensive. Um, but can be neater. And then you can just make something for free out of pallets or wire. And these have some pros or cons. Um, so if you're doing the free version, you know, it's pretty easy to put together. I have a couple of these for extra compost. Yeah, pretty much free, but you might get some critters. So if you're in town or you're worried about squirrels digging in there or, you know, a raccoon or two, you know, you might, this might not be your first option. I'll show you why I still have one of these, even though I do live in the town of Fergus Falls. Um, it's pretty easy to get in there, but you know, free is also nice. The tumbler, these cost maybe, you know, a hundred dollars or more. So depending on what you're interested in, uh, this just may not be for you. You'd want to have enough capacity because if you see at the bottom here, it really needs to be three cubic feet or more if you want that bin to heat up really well, and that's due to microbial activity in the bin. But yeah, neater, easy to turn it. Um, we've got a ball here that we use with school kids. Sometimes I think I have a picture of it coming up. That's another option. But again, that's like $100 or more, depending on the model you get. Um, so there's this other DIY option. Again, um, inexpensive, but it's, it's going to get heavy. So it also, you have to think about, you know, your physical capacity to roll something or lift something or tip something over, depending on what you want. Um, the one on the right, this is very popular just because it's kind of middle of the road, easy to use, um, keeps things neat and tidy, has enough volume, and, and they're pretty readily available. So lots of options there. And then when you're thinking of where to put it, um, you know, just keep in mind that you're going to need to bring out food waste to this bin maybe a couple of times a week if you have a pail in your kitchen. So you don't want it a mile away from your house. You're probably going to be less likely to, likely to use it or pay attention to it. Um, but similarly, you don't want it right up next to a building because it's decomposition. You don't want to start accidentally decomposing the back wall of your garage or something. Um, sun or shade doesn't really matter. You know, you want somewhere where there's not going to be a lot of pooled water. You don't want a lot of water, extra water running onto it. A little rainfall is okay, but not dump dumps of water on it because um, wet compost usually is kind of smelly. And then just be thoughtful about your neighbors. So 
Just as an example, in Fergus Falls, you need to have your bin at least one foot from the property line, not within a side yard or front yard setback and then 20 feet from habitable buildings, but that doesn't include your own house. So if it's closer to your own house, that's fine, but you wouldn't want it like right underneath your neighbor's bedroom window or something like that. But if you're taking good care of it, it probably wouldn't be an issue, but just be thoughtful. Um, I think sometimes there's a negative association with a compost bin. And uh, so we can all kind of help dispel that by doing a good job of taking care of it and siting it properly what to put in your bin. I think this is sometimes confusing for people. So at, at its most basic, keep it at things that are from plants. So no meat, no dairy products, and no bones. Those are the big no-nos. Just because they're gonna smell, they're maybe not gonna decompose quite as much because they're so protein heavy. Um, and they're gonna attract the kind of visitors that you don't want, like raccoons, skunks, um, other things like that. So if you're concerned about that, keep it to plant-based stuff. Um, likewise, a lot of oil is not a good idea. Um, if there's a little oil on some noodles that you're throwing in there, that's probably fine, but just not a lot of oily stuff. No cheese, no yogurt, no, no milk, um, and you should be good. So green materials are more wet and they're rich in nitrogen. So this would be your fruits and vegetables, peels, pits, um, moldy bread, mold is just a decomposer, that's just fine. Noodles, old rice, flowers, um, flower stems, coffee grounds, tea leaves, as long as the tea, tea bags aren't in the plastic type um, tea bags, that should be fine too. It's just a little bit of filter paper around those tea bags. And you're going to need to balance that out with dry brown materials. And you're actually going to need more of the dry brown materials than you are of the green materials. So this is why if you read about composting, you might read about people stockpiling dry materials um, or saving bags of leaves from the fall because you are to have a successful compost pile, you are gonna really need brown materials that are rich in carbon. They're dry, they're usually fluffier, and they're gonna help your pile not smell. They're gonna help your pile have air in it and they're gonna aid in decomposition. So dry leaves, wood chips, um, straw. If you run out of everything, you don't have leaves, shredded paper and shredded cardboard will work fine. Um, I stockpile leaves in an extra bin next to my compost and use them all year. So I don't like to bag mine and put them out on the curb. I save them for my compost pile. This is my favorite composting diagram, I think of all time, because it's just the perfect example um, of, of how to put stuff in a compost bin. This is my opinion kind of, but um, in a way that will facilitate a healthy compost pile and aid in decomposition. So this is called lasagna layering. Um, and on the bottom underneath your bin, there's lots of options. You could put a wood pallet. I find that makes it hard to clean it out later. Um, you could also just put a heavy layer of leaves close to the bottom. It's okay if your compost bin is, has an open bottom and is resting on the ground because actually all those beneficial soil microbes are going to go up into your compost. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So I just, I don't think the pallet's necessary, but you could put some sticks on the bottom or something just to have airflow underneath. So you are going to put in brown layers. That would be your leaves, your wood chips, your straw, thick brown layers. In between each brown layer, you can dump your green stuff or food waste. So I have a, I don't know the size, maybe it's um, maybe a one gallon kind of compost pail on my kitchen counter. So every time I dump in my compost pail, which would be the green layer of food waste, coffee grounds, apple cores, banana peels, et cetera, from my house, I put two very, very large kind of handfuls, almost like armfuls, on top. So this says absolutely no food showing. So follow every green layer with a brown layer. Exposed food is going to smell a little bit more and it's going to attract more unwanted attention from pests. So you want to cover it. You also want airflow. Decomposers need oxygen just like you. And I'll talk a little bit more about anaerobic versus aerobic decomposition in a few minutes. 
And then on the right is kind of showing that ratio for uh, every kind of pile of that green fresh waste, you're gonna want about two to three times as much in volume of the dry brown kind of fluffy woody waste or leaves. So this is really, um, if you nail this right here, you're gonna solve a lot of problems. Cause when I hear people saying, well, my pile smells too much or it's wet and slimy. It's because I think uh, people starting out put in a food waste, food waste, food waste, food waste, food waste, not layering in enough of that carbon rich dry stuff in between. And it's gonna smell, it's gonna smell. And if that happens, that's okay. When you're gonna mix this baby up, you're just gonna add in a bunch more woody dry stuff when you do that. And that is okay. It's still gonna break down, not the end of the world. We can do this imperfectly and we're still gonna have compost. So that's okay. And then you're gonna stir it up once in a while. This is gonna help distribute those beneficial microorganisms that might be coming up from the soil. If you're using a tumbler that is up off the ground, you actually wanna take some soil from your garden or from your yard, um, hopefully that hasn't been sprayed with a bunch of chemicals, so you still have some microbial activity in there. And you're gonna put a few handfuls in your tumbler because you need those beneficial organisms from the soil. So if you're using a tumbler, you wanna do that. Um, this is gonna get air in there, more on that in a minute, and it's gonna help distribute moisture. You kind of need a good moisture throughout there. This is the compost ball I was mentioning earlier. This is a fun thing we bring around to kids events or let kids do when they have tours. Um, what's more fun than rolling around a ball full of compost? Not much, it's usually their favorite part. Um, it can get quite heavy though. So just if you're interested in getting something like that, I think that was about $120. But when it's full, it's it's quite heavy and it takes a couple of people really to roll effectively. But but it's but it is fun. All right. So just I wanted to show I get a lot of questions about this. So I wanted to show how I do my bin. I have a black bin and you can see behind me in this little picture, um, some pallets full of leaves. And then I've got behind the tree trunk. That pallet bin is where I've pulled out half finished compost. And I'm going to scoop all the compost that's sort of more still cooking from my black bin. Um, there's doors often on the sides of these plastic bins. And they always show them being, you can open the door and pull out some finished compost. It's never worked for me. Let me know if it works for you because I've never seen it work. Uh, because you can't mix compost inside one of these composters. I, it just does not work for me. So what I do, if I can get this little video clip to work. I lift the entire thing off. You just lift it off. So you've got all your lasagna layers that you've added to that. Maybe took my family five months to fill that over the winter. <laughs> and um, afterward, you have this stack of your lasagna layering with the dry layers and the green layers. And I'm just going to pitchfork that over back into my pallet bin behind where I'm going to layer it back in with a few more leaves because it was still a little bit wet. So that's how I do mine. I don't ever stir it. Um, I fill up my bin and then I flip it over and it was, it was warm in there. I could feel the heat coming off with my hands. So I knew something was working. And now about a week later when it was mixed back in my pallet bin to kind of go on to its next stage of decomposition, it was warm again. So that my, microbial activity was happening. Whoops. I was just going to want to do it again and again. There we go. But to check for moisture, because you don't want it too wet and you don't want it too dry, you can perform the squeeze test. You can also eyeball it. If you can smell it, if it's too wet, it's going to be stinky. Um, it's going to look kind of slimy. And you're, you're probably going to be able to tell even without squeezing it that it's not quite right. If it's too dry, it's not going to heat up. And we'll go over some troubleshooting too. But in this picture, um, you can see on the top left, they're squeezing and no water droplets are coming out, but when they open their hand, it sort of is loose and hasn't really clumped together. That might be a little bit too dry. The top right, the moisture as it's being squeezed is running almost down their hand. That's a little bit too wet. So you want it to be like it is on the bottom right. You squeeze it, it clumps together, but you don't have liquid running down your hand or your arm. You want it to be like a wrung out sponge where most of the water has been squeezed out, um, but it's still wet enough to clump together. So this is um, kind of 
how you can differentiate between aerobic versus anaerobic decomposition. Um, so in a landfill, this is anaerobic. There's no oxygen in a landfill. Um, trash is essentially sealed in cells and packed down with heavy equipment and then covered with dirt and packed down again. So no air is in there or very, very little oxygen. So the only bacteria that can survive in that kind of environment are anaerobic, which just is a fancy word for without oxygen. And so when things decompose, which is very, very, very slow in those environments, they produce methane as waste. Um, and when I'm talking slow, I'm talking about like 25 years later, they can dig up a landfill and still find packages of hot dogs that look fine, heads of lettuce that are in the wrapper that pretty much look like lettuce once you peel off the outside. Um, a snail, slower than a snail's pace. Really decomposition is, um, it's, it's very, very, very slow in a landfill environment. We don't want that methane as a byproduct. We don't want to lock away those resources because that's all it is. We're putting resources in a landfill. We want to feed the life in the soil with composting. So composting is aerobic decomposition. So that's in the presence of oxygen. Those are beneficial bacteria that need oxygen to metabolize that food source. And so microbes are consuming organic waste and then secreting a bunch of nutrients and then other small invertebrates, you know, like worms or pill bugs or centipedes or other things are, are just part of that soil food web that are, that are aiding in that process. And this is where it can get a little sciencey. Um, but again, don't be too worried if you don't understand some of the, the complicated parts about it heating up and cooling down and I don't even pay a super close attention to, to this, um, but it can be helpful to know that there's some different phases. So in the beginning, you have, some, have mesophilic um, bacteria that, that are active at a more ambient temperature. They start the decomposition process in your compost pile. As decomposition occurs, heat is kind of a byproduct of that activity and it starts to warm up. As it warms up, thermophilic, heat-loving bacteria start going to town, and they're decomposing things really quickly, generating a lot of heat. That's when your compost pile gets hot. That's what a lot of people call it. You want this to happen. This means you've got the right moisture. You've got the right balance of green-type nitrogen food waste and your dry carbon-based um, woody waste. You've got the right mix, it's gonna heat up. And as that, as they start to run out of what the, the food sources that they like, they're gonna to start to die off a little bit. Um, and that's when your compost is maturing. On the right, on the white graph, this is just giving examples of when you could turn your compost to facilitate that. Cause again, they need, these organisms need air to do their job. So time in days is on the bottom. So you don't wanna turn your compost every day because you don't wanna disturb those organisms all the time. You just wanna turn or mix your compost often enough to get some air back in there to help some more stuff break down to help those bacteria be active. So after about 10 days, there's a temperature peak and you could turn your compost, drops a little bit when you turn it. Um, another five days, there's another peak, you could turn it then. This is really active time. It starts to drop off. You can see that these two graphs look very, very similar in terms of the overall curve that they make. And then you can turn it again, maybe after two weeks or three weeks, and then it's gonna to start to mature and that temperature is gonna go down. That's also one of the signs that your compost is done is it's not warm anymore and it doesn't look like food waste. Again, you know, don't worry too much about this. You don't wanna turn it more than once a week, um, but you also don't wanna never turn it. I am the lazy composter. I fill my bin all the way up, and then I flip it into another one. So I don't actually turn it for like four months while it's filling. Guess what? It's still compost and that's what works for me. So it's just important to find out what works for you. Let's go over a little troubleshooting. I'm just gonna peek in the chat here. I know there were a few um, questions here. Oh, good. Somebody said pallets work well, two separate piles. Yep, one for starting. And then this person said one ready and then one starting and eliminate the bottom pallet. I absolutely agree. You don't need a pallet on the bottom. You actually want to be touching the soil. Great. I put eggshells in my compost. They're a valuable source of calcium. 
um, and other, some other minerals. I like to crush them in my hands before I put them in my compost bin. So they don't stay in whole pieces because they're very, very dense and hard. They're not going to break down very fast, but if you crush them, they're going to go faster and get um, mixed in better. Newspaper or office paper. Newspaper is better because it's going to have less kind of chemicals and additives and it's not going to be bleached as much. White office paper is usually bleached. Um, and you also want to stay away from glossy inserts in newspapers. So glossy in inserts actually have like a clay coating on them that makes them shiny. And you don't want to put that in your compost bin. So shredded newspapers is the best option. Yep, staples. Somebody's asking about staples on tea bags. Yeah, I try and pull those off. Um, some of them now don't have that, which is kind of nice. They're more like sewn through the tea bag. Um, you can use some twigs. Just be aware that sticks, especially if they're bigger, are going to take longer to break down. But twiggy stuff is absolutely fine. You might not want only twigs, maybe twigs, twigs and leaves. And then somebody's asking about worms. Can you add worms to your compost pile? Um, I wouldn't add composting worms to your compost pile because they're not a species found in Minnesota. So the worms we have here at the recycling center are Acena espatita. They're red regular compost worms, um, and they're really good and efficient at managing food waste, but they probably wouldn't survive a Minnesota winter. And even if they did, we probably wouldn't want to really introduce them to our ecosystem. You could certainly throw some earthworms from your garden in there. Um, but there's so many other decomposers that are already gonna be in that compost pile. I don't know that they would like the heat. It does get quite warm. So it probably wouldn't hurt, but I don't think it's necessary. All right, so if your pile, I think this is the most common problem that I've heard of for people. If your pile is wet and it smells gross, like rotting food, rotten eggs, rancid, sour, yucky, it's probably too wet. There's going to be a tiny bit of smell when you turn your compost, especially if there's a few pockets of really wet stuff in there. That's going to be normal. That happens to me too. Um, but I just stir in some of that extra dry stuff if I'm turning it and it seems a little bit smelly. But really, um, you can always just add a bit more dry stuff. Remember to add at least twice as much dry stuff as that food waste that you have to avoid that problem. If your pile is not getting hot, that might mean that your pile is too small. You need enough mass that the bacteria can really um, accelerate that decomposition process. And those thermophilic bacteria that are heat loving are, are gonna be able to thrive. So you need a big enough pile. You can insulate your pile. Having it in those black plastic contained bins can really help with that. Um, it's gonna provide a little insulation and assist with your pile heating up. It might also be too dry. So if you put way too much dry stuff, only leaves and sticks, you're not going to have enough of that nitrogen-based material to get your pile to heat up either. So you can make your pile bigger, make sure, it's, make sure it's big enough, add a little bit of water if it seems dry. If you squeeze it and it feels dry and crumbly, it's just too dry. So you can water it with a hose. Um, you can water it from a rain barrel if you have one of those. Um, leave the lid off. If it's going to rain, you can let some rain fall in there and add some food waste. If your pile is attracting animals. Now, I don't really care about this. Um, and I like a, a bin with a lid at first when my food waste is in there really fresh. But once it's been in there for a while and I flip it into my open bin and it's partially decomposed, animals seem to really not care about it anymore. Um, so if it's attracting animals and you're concerned about it, make sure that you're not putting in meat or dairy products. And you also want to make sure all those food scraps are totally covered with your dry materials. And that's really going to help solve that problem. If you're still having problems, you can put um, like landscaping, um, like that, met, like uh, almost like chicken wire, but it's like landscaping mesh on the bottom. I do wrap the very bottom of my plastic bin in chicken wire because squirrels chewed through a few of the vents on mine because they're just like rats with tails and I have too many of them at our house. Um, so I do cover the little vent holes just because I'm tired of them chewing on them. But again, you know, it's just some wildlife. They're not going to hurt anything. You know, it's um, some of that's pretty normal. So you just have to decide um, how careful you want to be. And then to use it. So you know when it's done, when it starts to smell like dirt, 
It's going to smell good. It's not going to look like food anymore. And it's also not going to be warm anymore. It should kind of be an ambient temperature. So if you put your hand on your pile and it looks pretty much like dirt, but you still feel some heat coming off it, it's still kind of cooking. You could turn it, wait a few more weeks and check again. You can also screen it. So if you have like, yeah, like a, a, a mesh, like a, a screen with slightly bigger holes or some really small hole chicken wire, you would just put that over a wheelbarrow or other container, dump your compost on top and kind of sift it back and forth like a sifter. It's just gonna improve the texture and then anything that's still too chunky, throw back in your compost bin. But there's so many uses for this. Mix it into your garden beds or top dress it with an inch or so of compost. You can rake it over low spots in your line, lawn. I have all kinds of weird uh, pits in my lawn. So I've been filling them with compost and then compost and then a little bit of grass seed to try and level that off. You don't want to totally smother the grass though. So usually you only put about a quarter to a third of an inch and then kind of rake it over. Um, so the grass isn't totally covered. It, it'll settle down into the grass a little bit more. You can mix it with potting soil, one part compost, two parts potting soil, or you can use it as mulch around the base of trees or shrubs or any other landscaping, especially if your compost is a little twiggy or rough, um, kind of like in this picture, that would be a good use for that too. It's gonna provide some nutrients and improve the soil quality and provide some protection for those plants. And just like you might get a few you know, animal visitors, you are gonna see bugs and that is just normal. They're just decomposers. There's a lot of mold and bacteria that are assisting with decomposition. You might have flies, you might have magnets. Mag magnets. It is a magnet for insects and decomposers. Those are just decomposers too. So it is totally natural that they would be in your bin. Don't be concerned. If you have tons and tons of mag maggots or something gross, you're probably not having enough dry stuff. You might be leaving too much food waste exposed or you might be putting too much stuff in there that is um, on the no-no list, like meat or dairy products that's just not breaking down quite the way plant waste would. Centipedes, millipedes, pill bugs, beetles, worms, slugs, these are just decomposers. They're helping break down that stuff just like they do in nature. That is just part of the process. So what can you do? Don't feed the landfills. I love this poster. Um, there's a bunch of national parks that kind of had a uh, a campaign to reduce their waste. And I just really love that. You know, instead of don't feed the wildlife, don't feed the landfills. Let's not do that. You can reduce your food waste. Um, we have more information on that on our website. Compost what you can't eat. Don't feed those landfills. Keep your compost bin tidy. We want to have, let composting have a positive image. You know, don't, we don't want to be the people that everybody's complaining about because we have these smelly, messy piles that are unsightly right next to their uh, backyard. Um, so we want to, you know, just pay a little bit of attention and take care of it. You can also leave some leaves on your lawn. This is actually a really positive thing for your soil. You can, uh, you can mulch mow leaves in to your lawn a little bit, um, but leaving some leaves, this is often where moths or some other beneficial insects make their cocoons in the winter. They overwinter in the leaf litter layer in the wild. So you can kind of mimic this in your yard by leaving some leaves and letting them decompose, or at least at the very least waiting to clean those up until later in the spring. Um, and that can actually provide some insulation around plants as well. So you don't always need to completely clean your yard in the fall. Um, it's actually better not to. And then help spread the word. You know, maybe somebody's going to be curious about what you're doing, or you have family that's kind of interested and they're on the fence, you know, help, help get them on board because this used to be common. Everybody used to compost or have chickens and food was not going, you know, into a landfill the way it is now. And we really can return to some of those older practices to solve some of our environmental problems. And then just stay informed. We do have a seasonal e-newsletter, news you can reuse. You can subscribe to that or just to updates on our website when those get sent out. And then let's check the chat. So if you have questions or if you have comments or anything, Feel free to pop those in there. We are almost at 45 minutes, but I can hang around as long as needed because I could talk about composting anytime, all day. And thank you for joining. I've got a little bit more here. Someone is asking, is it best to have two containers 
So when you turn it, you can turn it into a different bin so you can start a new in your first bin. That's how I do it. As I mentioned, those plastic composting bins, um, they don't, they're not a great one size fits all solution because if you're adding stuff to that bin and you can't pull the finished stuff out of the bottom, it, it's going to be hard to manage. And so I really feel like using that as your primary bin that you're filling with new organic waste and then having a secondary bin that you have turned that into and, and let that kind of finish decomposing in there. And that can be open because animals are going to stop caring about it once it's half broken down. I personally prefer that. I know there's people out there that maybe don't want that. Um, I just really struggled having the one bin because you're always going to have something cooking. So when do you ever take out the stuff that's done? It, it just um, doesn't work super well. So I would recommend two, but one would be covered and one, it could be covered or it could be open. That's one that's less important. That's a really good question though. I think um, once we get into composting, you realize one is just not enough. Let's see, next question is, can old mulch be used as brown material or is it too full of chemicals? Um, that probably depends. I know some mulch is dyed uh, like a color, like the red stuff. I don't know what that dye is made of. Um, so you might wanna look on the package or investigate that. That's why I try to only use natural mulch that's not dyed just because it's gonna have less chemicals on it. And then I would absolutely, you know, some of that could go in the bin too. If it's just those wood chips though, keep in mind wood is very dense and hard. So just like a lot of twiggy stuff, it's not gonna break down as fast. Leaves are so fabulous because they're not as dense, they're dry and fluffy. I usually have ridiculous amounts of them in the fall. They're free. Um, so they just really work the best for me. But again, if you don't have access to that, wood chips, straw, shredded paper are all alternatives that are gonna work for you. Next question is, do you stir and compost all winter? And how long does it usually take from start to finish to have compost ready? And I, I probably glossed over that a bit on one of those slides. So um, from start to finish can really be highly variable. If you're willing to invest more time in managing your compost, you might have finished compost in like eight weeks or 12 weeks because I am um, a little time poor. Um, you know, I just don't have as much time. I tend to, and I like to fill that entire plastic bin entirely full before I flip it. Mine goes slower because I don't manage it as actively. It's still going to work. It's still composting. It's just kind of preference and your ability to maintain it. So if you're going to turn it more frequently, you know, every week or every two weeks, really consistently, it's going to go faster. I'd say a couple of months. If you're slow like me, it might take you a whole year just because I just don't manage it as closely as, as I could be. And I'm just busy and, th and that's okay with me. I'm okay with that. It still is compost. My compost is looking pretty good right now. Um, so really I would say six weeks to a year, really, because it depends on how you're doing it. And then I do compost all winter. So all winter, I fill up my compost bin and because I can't stir it as much because it does freeze, which is fine. That just makes the food waste mushier, which helps it break down faster. That's just fine. Winter is a great time to start composting too. You don't have to wait. It's not only for summer. I fill that entire bin and I use that lasagna layering and that's what's making sure that dry material is getting integrated into the food waste enough so that I don't just have a slimy, stinky mess every spring. It's already got those layers of brown material that are helping get that airflow in there right from the bat. Going over a machine. All right, and what about composting bags? And if, if people need to leave, you can go ahead and leave. I'm just, I'll just keep answering questions as long as people have questions. Um, what about composting bags? So compostable bags, or compostable plates, forks, they're kind of made out of bioplastics. Those are intended to be composted in a commercial composting facility that gets up to really high. Bags. We yeah. should be adding a little water to that pail you take out. Never thought of that. <laughs> that's a lot of problem is we're not watering our compost piles mm -hmm. well we do that at home yep so um it, those are just not going to break down in your backyard compost bin she uses like she said she's eye. a lazy composter i mean she's all for it but she said i don't take she the can't either, no oh so. somebody's not muted do you have a question 
maybe it's me. Yeah, do you have a question? Okay, so go, yeah, go ahead and pipe up if you have a question or throw it in the chat. Okay. Um, yep, if people need to leave, they're welcome to leave. But if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thanks for joining. All right, somebody's asking, would there be any issue using pine needles instead of leaves? Um, pine needles are, I mean, I think it's thought that they make the soil more acidic, but I've read things that says they're not as much of an issue as people think. So once they start to break down, it's not an issue. I maybe wouldn't pile a ton of pine needles into my composting bin. Um, they're kind of denser. They might not break down as fast. Um, but you know, some probably won't hurt, but I just, I maybe wouldn't use that for all of my dry material. Um, what was the other thing I was just thinking of with pine needles? I had just thought of something else and now I can't think of what it was, but, um, oh, other things, there's some other things you might wanna limit like um, lemon peels or, you know, orange rind. If you have a little bit of lemon peel or, or or lemon rind or, or orange peels, that's okay. Sometimes that's on a no list for composting, but if unless you have boatloads of it because you had a lemonade stand all weekend, you might not wanna put buckets full in there all at once because of the acidity, but the average family using a few lemons a week or something and you throwing those in there is not a big deal. Um, some of those things can just be used in moderation. And this, this is all going to be put on the county website. So someone was asking if this can be provided later. I can put a PDF of the PowerPoint along with that recording. So if you wanted to go back and review anything or, or look back um, and even watch it again or, or share it with somebody else, you absolutely can. Um, and there's a question, does grass count as green matter and how much to use? So fresh grass that you've just cut is going to be high in nitrogen and it would be a green part of the green nitrogen rich category. So you could use some, but if it's fresh, it's going to be green. So you'd want to balance that out with your dry materials. If it's dry grass clippings, and it's actually good to leave some of that on your lawn, because that's fertility from the soil. You can just leave some of those on there. You don't always want to remove that. If you do want it off of there and you're going to add it to your compost, if it's dry and old and it's more like dry leaves, that would then be a brown. But if it's fresh and green, it would be high in nitrogen. And one last question, how about ash from a wood stove? That's okay as long as it's not from treated wood and you'd maybe wanna mix it in a little bit gradually, but yes, bur uh, ashes are a great fertilizer. Um, they're kind of, um, if you like burn, uh, like native prairie or something that's providing a little boost of fertility there too. So this, this would be similar. You can add that, but I wouldn't add anything from charcoal briquettes or anything like that because that's from actually like a fossil fuel source. So that's a little bit different, but a little bit of wood ash mixing that in there is fine. You can also go out and scatter that as long as you make sure that's not hot anymore. All right. And if there's no more questions, I will stop. And thank you so much, everyone.